I'm excited about the series, you know, almost, it's usually in May, where we talk about vision, and we, we do remind the church what our vision is here, and why we do what we do, and then how we do it, but we also wanna tie that into your life, in that God has a vision for your life, so the first week we preached on sight versus vision, Summer preached on the crown of love last week, and I wanna preach a message entitled Build Up this week, and I believe it will speak to you and help all of us move forward. I'm preaching to myself today. I do every weekend, and uh, I believe it will help us today. And, but before I get into the message, I wanna take time just to honor the Dream Team. Now, before we clap, please, the Dream Team is a compilation of all the different teams here at City Church, and it's the, it's the active volunteers that really help make what we do possible. So these are the people from the street to the seat, as we call it, from this, in the parking lot all the way in, from the stage to the screen, so all the media teams, we have the grounds, we have city kids, we have so many different teams, so many different people. They are amazing. Let's give it up for the Dream Team today. I love them, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, they help us all and they do amazing We've added over 50 people to the Dream Team this year already. Our goal is 100, so we're already halfway there. And, uh, and we believe in you. Now, uh, to honor the Dream Team and even, I would say, group leaders and co-leaders of groups, this Friday night, we are having a comedy night just for you. We're gonna have comedian Jaron Myers join us, and, uh, and then we're gonna give out some awards. It'd be my heart, it's Summer and I's desire that every single person on the Dream Team, every group leader, every co-leader would come to this event because we just wanna love on you and say thank you and have a good time and we can laugh and have fun in church, right? And, and so please come and please make plans. Uh, they'll send you out information. I know they already have and they will again this week before Friday, but we would love to have you join us. Now you would say, well, why are you talking about this? Because not everyone is on the Dream Team. If you're not on the Dream Team, and you wanna to come to a comedy night, I would ask you to join the Dream Team. Then you could come to a comedy night. Come on, somebody. Like how I did that right there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Father, I thank you so much for what you're doing. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Please keep us safe in this room, in this moment, as we go about our week. Lord, I pray that all of us right now would lay down any resistance we may have. We would set aside our distractions we would lean in with open hearts and receive something new today. Help all of us move forward in our faith. Jesus, we give you everything. You are good and your mercy endureth forever. And everyone said amen, please. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter eight. If not, they'll put it on the screen. I do wanna give a little context before I read, please, uh, so that, I mean, this makes sense. I only have time really to read three verses. I would encourage you to read this whole chapter. It's not that long. Um, I am gonna reference other verses in this chapter here in just a moment in the message to tie this together, but I wanna focus on these first three. Corinth was an ancient city that was very large. It was one of the largest cities in the known world at that time, and we believe by the studying of the church through the church fathers and and different means that we believe that the church at Corinth had tens of thousands of people in it. Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians to the church to give them guidance because they had a lot of struggles and a lot of issues as they were growing and as people were coming to faith in Christ. So when you read those letters, understand it's for us today, but it's also in the context he was you know, writing it to help this church you know, steady that of themselves and really, you know, I would say grow in their faith and be strong for generations. What was happening now in America, uh, I would say most of us have never seen this and you know, definitely don't do this, but in other parts of the world today, this is still happening. And so in this part of the world, when Paul was writing, people would cook food and they would worship multiple gods and they would make statues for those gods. They would cook, you know, let's say chicken, and then they would set it at the base of the statue, and they would worship this false god, and then eat the food and celebrate. We use the word pagan to mean that it was godless. 
there's no boundaries, it's just anything goes. And so it was pagan ritualism and people had a plethora of gods and they would do this all the time. Well, what happened was is people would come to Jesus that used to do that. And so people that were more seasoned as a Christ follower had no problem that if someone cooked food and offered it to an idol and then tried to give it to them as a seasoned Christ follower, they had no problem eating some good baked chicken with some seasoning on it. Come on, right? Amen, Jesus. But newer Christians, as Paul said, they were weaker at that point in faith. Their conscience would bother them and they could not eat food offered to idols because it hindered their conscience. They felt like they were doing something wrong. So the Apostle Paul is writing this to help people understand how to use their knowledge in the church and not hurt someone that felt that eating this food was wrong and then not putting down someone who ate the food that was prepared for an idol. I know it's a little different for us, but I'm gonna make this make sense here for modern day here in just a moment. And that's the context of this message. So notice in verse one, he says, now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. But notice this line. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Everyone say build up, please. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. This is a kind version. There's another version that says those that think they know something don't really know anything. And then he says, but whoever loves God is known by God. So I wanna start off with this idea of puff up, and then I wanna lead in to build up. Now in our community here where we're at, education is highly valued, and it should be. Let me just say this, education is good, it's not wrong. It's good to learn, it's good to grow, it's good to read books. In fact, I'm telling my boys, you are gonna read a book, amen. Um, and, um, and so they've read books about you know, Dr. King, Jackie Robinson, and different heroes of our country. It's good to learn, it's good to understand, and to have education. And the Bible says to love God with all of our mind anyway. Our mind is a gift from God, but our mind without Jesus, even with Christ, at times is battling, at times doing good, right? So we gotta have God help our mind, but. Education is not wrong. However, I would say that it would be a mistake to put God in an intellectual box, to think that if I don't figure God out, I'm not gonna serve him. If all this doesn't make sense to me intellectually, then I'm not gonna follow Jesus. That would be a mistake because Jesus is above our intellect. God is a genius. I know I'm not. I don't know about you, but I'm not a genius. He is. And there are certain things about our faith that intellectually we can wrap our mind around and we can understand, and that's a good thing. There's other parts of our faith that are beyond our reasoning, and God is supernatural, and God can do what we can't do. He can do anything at any time, and he is God. Can someone say amen, right? There, so we gotta understand that. If you don't know Jesus, receive Jesus. If you're far from him, come back to him. Because knowledge is a part of our faith, but it's how we use knowledge that really determines so much. So the idea of puffing up is we have knowledge. And we see here in our verse, he says that we all possess knowledge about this issue, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Here's why I believe we have the temptation to use knowledge in a way that puffs up ourselves. Let me just... Just stay with me here for a moment, please. Everyone in this room and online, we have an inherent desire to be important, to be wanted, and to be accepted. Because of that, it's easy for us with that desire to also have this side desire to be better than other people, to be better than them, stronger than them, have more than them, know more than them. I'm teaching them. They are under me, I am stronger, I'm better. That is in our DNA. That's why, that's just one reason why we need Jesus to help us, okay? And when it comes to knowledge, knowledge helps, 
if we're not careful, it kind of scratches that itch. And we can turn it in, the, in a Christian sense and we can deviate it from what it's meant for and turn it to puff up ourselves because we are desperate to want to be important. We want our life to matter. We want other people to like us. And so we can use knowledge as a way. And then we have this side thing of also wanting to be better than people. So it's complicated. And then so it's all mixed up. And then when it comes in the name of Jesus, it can be really weird. Have you been there before? And so what we want to do is use knowledge in the right ways. And for example, all of us have done this. We've heard something on the news. We've read something. Someone told us something. Maybe it was the latest scoop on some situation that, you know, of a friend or something, you know, nationally speaking. And we go to a group of friends and all of us have done this. Hey, 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 you know, I just heard this. And we love to tell people, you know, something new. Have you been there? To make ourselves feel important, a secret or an insight track thing. And that just proves what I'm saying, that that is a part of our desire. But in this story, what was happening in this church is they were using knowledge in a wrong way and they were puffing up one group or certain people and putting down another group. And it was all from, I believe, this in, inward insecurity of needing to be known, needing to be important, and then mixed with, I wanna be better than people. And this is where Jesus wants you and I to really avoid and do it different. And at City Church, we're gonna do it different, right? We're not gonna do it this way, but let me lay this out. In Christianity, here's how knowledge is turned in a puffing up manner. We use knowledge to divide, I would say, from each other versus bringing us together. So I'm not picking on these groups, but just stay with me. A Baptist, a Methodist, and a Pentecostal. When knowledge is used to puff up, we look at the differences and say, well, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with this. I don't agree with this. I have to divide from you because I don't, you know, I don't agree with you. And really, internally, we have this sense of I'm better than you. I have, a, I have the true doctrine. I, I have a true belief, and therefore, I know more than you, and I can't be with you. That's not the heart of God. We also use it to prove points. But I always say this, we can prove points and miss hearts all day long. Jesus has not called us to prove points. He's called us to make a difference. And it's okay to have a point, but we're not called just to prove them all day long. We're called to make a difference. We can use knowledge, as I've already said, to be better than other people, to lord that on them, to, to say, I'm, I know more. I'm better than you. I have more than you. I have, you know, in Christendom, I have the true doctrine. I have the true teaching. If you listen to me, I mean, you'll go the right way. And from a wrong heart, that's a mistake. We can also use it, as I mentioned, to separate and divide. And I believe when we do that, we miss big moments. Paul was giving guidance and direction to a young megachurch that needed help in a lot of ways. And if you read the whole chapter, Paul uses this um, he uses this language. He says that some of the people had superior knowledge on the subject. That means uh, they were seasoned Christians about this issue. Then he says others were weaker in the faith. But Paul gave the insight that those that had superior knowledge were to serve those that were weaker in the faith at that moment and not use it as a wedge to hurt people. This is, as I'm preaching this, maybe some of us are thinking, I would never do this. But it is such a temptation because at the core of us, we want to matter and we want to feel important. And at times, we have to have validation by being better than other people. And yet Jesus has something better for us. Aren't you glad? Now, here's how this translates because we're not offering food to idols. We're not arguing about that. So here's how this translates right now. Maybe write some of these down. Modern day, right now, last two years, we can do this in church world about social media. Social media, we can, you know, get all worked up, hate people, you know, unfriend them, cuss them, and people can even go off on people and never have to see them face to face. And that's breeding, I would say, unhealthy dialogue because really we're taught in scripture to confront someone face to face, go to them. They didn't have, you know, Facebook back in the Bible, right? So they had to go to them and talk. Social media is a way we do this. Politics is a way we do this right now, using knowledge to puff up. One group uses Bible verses and the other group uses Bible verses. Now, it's okay to have your own conviction because we have that right in America. I'm not here to, 
I mean, to tell you that, I'm just saying that we in the church world are using politics to point at each other, and one group says, yeah, da, 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 and we use the same verse, and, the other, and, it's, and it's the same verse. We're using knowledge to puff up. We're not accomplishing anything. How about doctrine? As I mentioned, we, and we love to split hairs, if you will, over doctrine that doesn't have anything to do with heaven or hell. And then we get all worked up and we start getting off on people and they're, I mean, they're a weak church and we're a strong church and we believe this and we believe that and they don't believe this and they're wrong and, and then we have all these things and we get all worked up and we're using knowledge to puff up versus to build up. Church style is another one. People have whole conferences and, and deep discussions about you know, the church dynamics, lights and smoke and suits and ties and jeans and shirts and jeans that are too tight and shirts that are too big, you know, and we get all worked up and we're using knowledge not in the right way, we're using it in the wrong way. Even food, you know, people get worked up about food and I think it's cool, you eat what you wanna eat, I'll eat what I wanna eat, but some people are really strict about diet and they go to the Old Testament and they tell you if you eat ribs, then you're eating something wrong and I'm telling you, ribs are amazing. And, and, and I think it's cool, you think it's wrong, but I think it's good. Get a little hot sauce on that thing, you bake that in the right sauce, come on, Jesus. It, Jesus likes ribs, I'm convinced. You know? And, and, and so people have that, and so that's fine, but we, you, but we can use diet and use scripture, use knowledge to puff up and put other people down. That's not what the Bible says. Paul actually said that in the new covenant of Jesus, if you bless the food, it is good to eat. So I eat it. <laughs> and crab legs and lobster tail, hallelujah. All right? How about the vaccine? Felt that one, didn't you? <laughs> so someone got the vaccine, or they got it. You know, someone has the vaccine or, and they received it. Well, you don't have faith, you've trusted in man. And then some person that doesn't have the vaccine, you know, and reporting at them, and you're stupid, and you should be vaccinated. And we're going at each other, using knowledge to puff up versus build up. Gifts of the Spirit's another one. Gifts of the Spirit are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Nine function, nine functions, excuse me, of the Holy Spirit. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, prophecy, discerning of spirits, gift of faith, Gift of miracles, right? Gift of healings. Speaking in tongues. And interpreting those tongues. Watch out now. And so we use this knowledge. Some churches are for it. Some are against it. Vaccines, whatever it is. And we make statements and we divide and we use knowledge to puff up something Versus build each other up, and God has a better way for you and me, and I want our church to follow that way. How about you? That's why, that's why we do what we do here. So notice here in our verses, he says love builds up. Then he says those that think they have the answers or that know something really don't know what they're talking about. But whoever loves God is known of God. So that's puff up. Now let's go to build up. This shows us how we are to build up. The love of God, ladies and gentlemen, is so profound. If you're a seasoned Christ follower, I pray that you and I would never get tired of certain subjects, but it's easy to. Well, I've heard about the love of God before. I don't wanna hear another message about the love of God, but the reality is he first loved me, therefore I love him. It's the love of God that blows my mind. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus to be the sacrifice for our sin. That when you and I receive Jesus, we can go to heaven. This is, I mean, it blows my mind that God did that with no guarantee of us receiving him. He did that when we, he knew we would curse him, mock him, revile him, go away from him, not believe in him, and do all sorts of wrong. And then when we come to him, we still have a hard time and we still mess up. Are you like me? And he still gave his love freely. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it and we don't do anything to get more of it. He loves you and I at its highest point, full measure, all the time, on our best day, on our worst day, when we get it right, when we get it wrong. He loves you and me. This blows our mind because our love is transactional. 
I gave, you know, I do this for you, you do this for me. And when you don't, we have a problem. Thus is the arguments in every marriage. All the married couples, yeah, I know I got you. Tell the truth now. You gotta tell the truth to go to hell. I'm just saying. But the love of God, the love of God doesn't operate like that. And it's the love of God that really stirs us, and it's the love of God that builds up us and others. Love is how, let me write this down. Love is how we are known. Knowledge is how we are heard. Love is how we are known. Knowledge is how we are heard. Love is how we are known. That's what the scripture says in verse three. Knowledge is how we are heard. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. This is basic stuff. God made us this way. And when you and I have the love of God, we're to build each other up and to help each other and to nourish each other along the way. We are not to use knowledge to lord it over people, to put people down, to make fun of people, to say you're not as strong as me because you can't eat this or do this or that. That's not the heart of God. We are to build people up. We are to let go of puffing up and we are to grab on to building up. And I will preach more than one way. Amen. Let go of puffing up and let's build up. Hallelujah. Some of you haven't got it yet, but you're going to get it on the way home in the name of Jesus. Some of you just are getting it right now. It's just coming across the room right now. <laughs> I never forget when I first saw the movie, The Cross and the Switchblade, a book written and a movie made for the story of Pastor David Wilkerson, who left a small town to go to the inner city of New York to reach the gangs. He later would become the pastor of Times Square Church, a world-renowned church that has done so many things that we don't even know about in New York City. When he first got there, he met a gang member named Nicky Cruz, and he began to love on him. And Nicky Cruz was a gentleman that was Hispanic descent. David Wilkerson was a white man. There was racial tension in the 60s. There was all types of things, and they didn't know why he was there, and they didn't like the Jesus he was, he was preaching. So Nicky beat him up. And on the ground, this pastor is beat up, battered and bruised, and Nicky pulls out the switchblade. And getting ready to stab him. And Pastor David looks up and he says this famous line, you can cut me into a thousand pieces, but every piece will scream, I love you. And that man was frozen in his tracks. Nicky Cruz received Jesus, became a great preacher. And many, I mean dozens and dozens and dozens of gang members came to Christ and a powerful church was born because a man was willing not only to receive the love of God, but he built up and he gave it freely. And I believe that part of New York City was changed. You see, God wants you and I to receive his love and give his love. He doesn't want us to stay over here in the puff up area. And we're using knowledge to make us feel important to make us feel like we're better than people to make us feel like we're needed. He wants us to build up. Now, I'm going to reference a few verses here later on in the chapter right now so that you can have context to what our heart is here at City Church. Because in verse 13 of the same chapter, Paul said to prefer those people that don't know. In other words, those that were weaker in faith, they felt like they couldn't eat meat offered to an idol. They didn't know, they, you know, whatever reason they couldn't do it. Paul said, prefer them. In other words, when you're at the dinner table and someone brought chicken that was just made for an idol somehow, Paul is saying in that setting, set it aside, prefer them because they can't handle it and serve them. So notice, don't use knowledge to puff you up. Use my love to build them up. That's our heart at City Church. Then, in verse 11 of the same chapter, he says, honor where others are. In other words, if, if they can eat meat offered to an idol, then honor them. If they can't, then honor them. Respect them. Let it be. But don't try to convince each other what you should be doing because the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So let me give you just two examples of modern day that I think will make a little bit of sense. One is, is more personal to me with my family history of church, but I think 
I mean, you get the picture. So let's go to alcohol. This is a big topic that people, you know, want to discuss in church culture, alcohol. And so, you know, uh, the scripture in the New Testament says, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. And then we know that Jesus' first miracle, he turned water to wine. And some people that are against alcohol, you know, I mean, they'll preach and they'll say, but it really wasn't alcohol. He turned the water to wine. It was alcohol, okay? He did. And they accused Jesus of being a wine bibber. Jesus drank wine. We also have verses that tell us the dangers of alcohol, Old and New Testament. For example, Ephesians 5, 18, don't be drunk with wine where there is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So we understand the dangers of alcohol, but the Bible gives both, right? In Galatians chapter 5, lifts a different aspects of acting out in a wrong way and, 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 and having too much to drink and being drunk is listed in that text. But here's the thing. How do we do this topic? I personally don't drink alcohol because there's alcoholics in my family. Now, I, at one time in my life, did drink alcohol and it wasn't good for me, so I stopped. That's because of my family history. Like, for example, when I go to certain restaurants and they have like a peach tea or a pomegranate tea, I'll drink, I mean, I'll drink like eight of them during the meal. Those things are amazing to drink, right? And in my mind, like, I know, I know. It's like I'm in control, but I'm not. Like, I'm just, you know, I want another. And, and, and I'd, I'd rather it be pomegranate tea than Jack Daniels. That's just for me. Some of you can handle glasses of wine and beer and do it in the context of scripture and you're good. So that's between you and God, just like this is between me and God. Now as a pastor up here on stage and all these people in this room and online, I have to be balanced. I would never tell. In fact, I would say this. If you have addiction in your life or it's a, you know, maybe in your family, please consider what you're doing because it could be a danger to you. I will never be reckless up here. I've heard people get reckless on this extreme of alcohol or that extreme of alcohol, and both are wrong. It's in the middle, but you have to know yourself, and if there is a tendency to abuse it, I would encourage you to ask God to help you not do it. If you can handle it and you feel okay to do that and walk with God, then that's fine. That's with you and the Lord, but here's an example. It's not my job to say, well, you drink, and so you're wrong. I'm wrong when I do that. And then the person that drinks, it's not their job to say, well, you don't drink alcohol and you're religious and you're bound up and I don't like you. That's wrong too. We are to honor each other and prefer each other where we're at and work out our own salvation and just live life and love God and love people. Does that make sense what I'm saying right now? And so we are not to try to convince people of our conviction. You have to go to the scripture and you have to do it. This is where knowledge puffs up and love builds up. Here's another example. I'm from an old school church, old school, where the women don't wear pants and they don't cut their hair and they don't wear makeup. And uh, some of my family really loves how our church is right now. <laughs> but I love my roots. I get it. I understand it. I totally understand where they're coming from. And you know what? It's all good. Personally, at City Church, we don't believe that our dress or our hair length is what gets us to heaven. That's not salvation. Wearing makeup is not salvation. What salvation is, the blood of Jesus. When you receive Jesus, he washes you. It's by grace through faith. So, you know, dresses or pants or this or that, that has really nothing to do with being saved. Now, I would say we shouldn't walk around naked. Right? Right? And I would say that, that, that the Bible does speak of modesty for men and women. So we should be modest. I mean, we should, you know, shouldn't be dressing crazy. But, but, but we don't believe that that is the case. However, if someone comes to church here or, not, or doesn't, and they believe they have to wear a dress, for them and their heart with God, they have to wear a dress. And they can't wear makeup. And that's their conviction. Check this out. You know what my job is? Rock it out. If that helps your conscience be clean, and if that helps you walk with God, I'll come alongside you. Let's walk with Jesus together. Yeah. It would be wrong for me to tell them, well, the Bible actually says, da, 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 and you can wear pants, and you should wear pants right now because you're bound in religion. I'm wrong because that's their conviction. It's okay for them to rock it out. If that's how they want to rock it, rock it. 
And then for them, they can't look at me and say, you're a compromiser and you're going to hell because that's wrong too. It's just that we see different on this issue, but we are preferring one another. These are just two examples of modern day things because we're not offering chicken to an idol. But this stuff is happening in a different context and we are to choose between puff up or build up. God wants us to build each other up. Check this out. In verse 13, Paul said to humble yourself to others and serve them. So Paul actually says in this chapter, he says, if me eating this meat, this chicken or steak, whatever it is, is offensive, I'm paraphrasing, if you can't handle it, I will never eat meat again. Notice the dynamics. One is puff up, you should eat meat. You should do this, you should do that. If you were really free in the spirit, then you could do this and this and this and this, and you're not on my level, and you need to do this to come to my level because I'm right and you're wrong, and I'm strong and you're weak. Think about that. I know we don't do this here, but I'm giving context because we're not gonna ever do this here. <sighs> this person shouldn't say, well, but your judgment, no, 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 Notice the dynamic of the puff up. Me. Look at me. Look at you. I'm right. You're wrong. You do this. And sometimes people are right and sometimes they are wrong. But how do we communicate that? Notice this side. Build up. Man, where are you at? How can I serve you? How can I serve you right now? Maybe we're even at lunch. We're at dinner together. We're doing church life together. We're doing group together. We're doing whatever. Man, where are you at? How can I serve you? Is this okay that you know, maybe, you know, I do this and that? Like, you know, how, you know, how does this feel for you? I'm, I'm here to help you grow in your faith. I'm not here to prove my point. I'm here to help you go into Jesus. How can I help you? Look at the difference. The Apostle Paul, who wrote over half the New Testament, was a bad man of jamma who did miracles and was beat and was shipwrecked and had all this clout, he said, if you can't handle it, I'll give it up forever because I'm here to build you up and to serve you. Notice Paul let go of being important, needing to be over people, needing to prove his position. He let that go and he built them up by loving them and helping them move forward. This is the heart of God for us at City. We're not gonna be a puff-up church. We're gonna be a build-up church. That's what we are, and that's what we're always going to be. We're not gonna use our knowledge to berate people, judge people, condemn people, and cast them out. There is biblical correction and biblical discipline that churches need to do when it happens, and we do that. But our heart is not to just whack people on the side of the head and use knowledge to puff up. That's not the heart of God. We are to build up, and we are to love, and we are to serve, and we are to give. We are to help do what Jesus has called us to do. And you and I are to receive the love of God, and then we are to give the love of God away. And when we give the love of God, and that story about the cross and the switchblade is a dramatic, crazy story, but it illustrates when someone lets the love of God come through them and rejects the puff up and chooses to build up, lives are changed because the love of God has power to it. It breaks through the hard hearts. It breaks through of the secrets. It breaks through the mentalities. It breaks through the resistance. It breaks through all the things that are set up and the love of God melts the hardest of hearts and it lifts people to a whole different place because it's God. This is what God wants us to do. So when you think about puff up or build up, what are you choosing today? In closing, I want to encourage you that you and I would choose to build up. Now, as a church, I want to give you some practical thoughts here of how we do this at City because our vision is to love people, build family, and lead to destiny. That's why we say love, build, lead. Please say that with me. Love, build, lead. How do we build? I'm gonna give context. We build primarily through groups. 
providing relationships for people to connect and form. This big church becomes small in groups. And I wanna challenge you, every year we have three different sessions of groups. In the spring, in the summertime it's smaller, it's like four or five weeks, then in the fall. We have groups that are more specific now than ever before. Recovery groups, we have, you know, we have groups for sexual trauma. We have groups for grief. We have groups for this and for that. And we have just groups to hang out. All times we get connected to a group. Say, I'm not here to push this on you. I'm here to lead you to it. Now, if you're not ready for that, that's fine. But at some point, I would encourage you to take a step and be in a group. Be in community. Because at City Church, our groups aren't to puff up and look down at people, our groups are designed to build up and come alongside each other and meet people that are different ethnicities than you, different stories than you, different backgrounds than you, but when you find out who they are, you realize we have a lot more in common than we think. And we connect on another level, we invest. Someone told me after the other worship experience that he said, I wish everyone would just take the step and get involved because he said, when we did that, he and his wife, we realized so much came back to us, but we had to step through and do it. Groups are not perfect. And if you join a group and it doesn't fit you, don't quit groups. Just try a different group. Just keep hopping groups until you find it. But connect and be a part of something bigger than yourself because we all need built up, don't we? We all have bad days. We all have low days. We all need support in our convictions. We're trying to walk this out with God. It's a challenge, it's not easy, and yet that's why we are called to be the church. So we're not called to use knowledge to whack people. We're called to use the love of God to help people. And we wanna help you too. I'll never forget, when you and I do this, when I was in corporate America on the north side of Indianapolis, Every day, they knew that I was wanting to be a pastor and I was preaching at that time and uh, supplementing the income for Summer and I's new family. And um, every day was a challenge because I had to decide, was I gonna puff up myself or build up people around me? They would talk about all types of stuff in the office. And I would just, just, you know, just lean with it, rock with it, you know, <laughs> and all that. And one day, a guy heard that I was a preacher and I wanted to be a pastor. I was... This was, you know, about 15 years ago. And um, he said, man, he said, he sat right next to me in the staff meeting and he said, hey, he said, man, I effing stop smoking. <laughs> and then he goes, and I effing lost 100 pounds. Hoorah, man, I don't know why you're telling me, but I think that's great. It's awesome. And I celebrated him. He said, well, you should. And what if I would have been like, wait a minute, wait a minute. My ears are holy. No one can cuss around me. <laughs> what if I went, I'm a man of God. You shouldn't be able to cuss to me. You see, all that silly stuff. Remember, Jesus is not weird. People are. <laughs> just remember that. And so I was just celebrating them and talking with them. And, and, and he wanted to tell me for, in his way, it was like he was making life change. And I was like, that's, and that's great, man. What I never dreamed of is that weeks later, my boss would randomly, after I transitioned out and joined the church full-time and started to work ministry full-time, I never dreamed of one day my boss calling me, weeping on the phone, saying, I need Jesus. And I got to lead my boss to Christ. And last I heard, he's still going to church. We can choose, puff up, look at me, and wah, ah, or we can come alongside people and serve them and build them up and help people along the way, in church and outside of church. In church, groups are a great way to do that, so pray and do that. Then we have next steps. Next steps is a once a month, I'll call it a class, but just don't let that word scare you. It's a once a month class that shares with you the history of our church our vision, our accountability, why we do the things we do, but it also lets us get to know you. And we get to know you so that we can help you, no pun intended, find out what's your next step at the church to help you connect. So this happens every month. It's once a month, it's about two hours on a Saturday. 
and we are here to serve you and to help you move forward. And so if you're new to City, I would invite you to come to Next Steps. You're gonna learn a lot, but more importantly, we're gonna learn a lot about you. And we wanna help you move forward. If you've been here for years and never gone to Next Steps, go please, because we would love the chance to get to know you more and to help you move forward. It's an on-ramp into what we're doing here. This is some practicality of how we build up. We wanna build family through relationships, build family through, the obviously, the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus touching us, but we build up people with our attitude and heart. And at City Church, we're committed to this. If someone's lying on the side of the road, we will never be that preacher or that Christian that walks by them and says, well, if you were to have done different, you wouldn't be there. If you were to listen to me, you would never have been there. If you were to live the way I lived, you'd be blessed like we will never do that. Our heart is to reach down and help them up and see how can I help you? How can I assist you to move forward in your faith? That's the heart of Jesus. It's to build up, not puff up. Aren't you glad Jesus builds us up? Let's give him a great thank clap of praise today. And so, right now, please bow your head and bow your heart to heaven. Everyone in this room and online can do this because God is with you. Every one of us, like me, outside, I wasn't the preacher, I wasn't the pastor, I was working in corporate America, and I know it works when you build people up. In church, right now, and then during the week through groups and events, it works. But we have a choice to make. Will we puff up or will we build up and serve each other? Right now, as your head is bowed and heart is bowed, you would say, Pastor Dave, I've never received Jesus in my life and or I have, but I'm far from him and I need to come back to him. I need to receive Jesus today and get my heart right with him. If that's you today, right now, go ahead and raise your hands to heaven. I wanna pray for you all over this room. God bless you. Thank you, thank you. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Awesome, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, give it up to them. Thank you so much. Excellent, thank you so much. I'm honored you would take that step. Thank you. Then how many would say, Pastor Dave, if I see it in me, there's, I have a tendency to puff up, but I want God to help me build up more. I wanna build up. I wanna prefer others. I wanna just walk this out. I wanna be a person that not only receives the love of God, but gives the love of God away. If that's you right now, go ahead and raise your hand all over this room and online. Thank you, hands up all over. And follow me and say, Lord Jesus, my heart is yours, and I run to you. Please forgive me for anything wrong in my life. I turn from that. I say yes to you. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, I choose to build up in my lifetime and make a difference for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give him a great hand clap of praise.